Alright, hello everybody. Alton and Reg from microgrinder.com back again with another video for our How to Beat 10 and 0 series. And for our first couple of videos, we did Reg doing some live play of 10 and L4 tabling on the 888 Poker Network. And to switch things up a bit, we thought we'd do a hand history review of some 10 and L that I played on Bovada. Um, for the next session, we're either going to do Reg playing some live playing again, or we'll do me playing some live play on Bovada for 10 and L. Um, but we figured that uh, doing a hand history review would get a little bit better of a deeper insight into um, how you can play these games and it also gives me a chance to see um, how Reg would play some of the more interesting hands I played and um, you know get some varying viewpoints on our strategies and I also have in addition to the um, replayer up as I have our our poker strategy Equilab as well so for some interesting spots if we want to um, if we find some interesting spots we can kind of sketch some ranges for our opponents and look at our equities and see you know how that determines how we should have played a certain hand um, but anyways we'll go ahead and get started so um, Reg the first hand here I have up I have uh, ace queen suited in the big blind and I'll just go ahead um, to preflop action mm. we have a relatively unknown player um, men raise it from middle position and then it folds around to the small blind and he calls um, at this point I think that this is a perfect squeeze spot seeing oh, how yeah, this I mean, guy's shown I mean passivity with you know men raise it shows weakness and this guy calls I mean, this guy's called he looks tight I mean, he's playing 14-0 it's a ridiculous small sample size but he still is he looks like he could be shaping up to be somebody who Plays quite slowly with quite large hands. And when I typically see these types of players, they can often turn up with way stronger hands than we'd expect. But having said that, <clears throat> um, Ace Queen suit is too strong just to flat him in race here. We can get plenty of value. We can have plenty of ways to stay aggressive post swap. So yeah, I would three bet and I would probably uh, three bet to. I certainly wouldn't go less than a dollar. That's for sure. Maybe a dollar, a dollar ten, something like that. Okay, so let's take a look at what I did. And I think I 3-bet, but I don't think I 3-bet a dollar. So I made it 4x, the original raise. Um, so a bit on the smaller side. But yeah, I, I see the understanding with the $3, because if we're looking at like a standard raise and we're just doing over around a 3x, being out of position to the original opener. Yeah, I think it's, it is mainly a positional thing, and I like to make my 3-bets larger than our position. I don't really pay too much attention to the open size, uh, because I just want to charge them to have the luxury position on the post flop. I mean, the reason they're mid opening is typically because they either want to lose less when they're um, race folding or they want people to make smaller three bets so it's cheaper for them to call and play a point in position. I don't really want to accommodate them with that. And yeah, although a dollar is a little bit bigger, we are squeezing as well. If it was just a three bet, I may have, you know, I may just go eight blinds too, but because it's a squeeze and there's two extra blinds in there, I think going ten blinds is is absolutely fine, and eleven blinds is fine too. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And with this player here too that we're squeezing, like you said, he's only playing fourteen percent of his hands, so he's playing a strong range regardless. And so, you know, if he's going to call eighty cents, he's going to call an extra three or four. Yeah, well, blinds. we think he's it's only seven hands. He could be. He's a bad player that's just had seven two or five times. We don't know, but we we can only we've only got the, what we've got, and we can assume right now the only assumption we can make is he's not excessively loose. So that's all we really know. So yeah, I mean, who knows? He, he could have had a lot of rubbish hands. He could have been playing really tight and folding some good hands. We just don't know. Well, exactly. we have to assume at the moment <clears throat> that he's going to be weighted towards stronger hands. Right, yeah, and that makes complete sense to me. Oh, and before we get we go any further, just for our viewers, let them know um, what all these mean. So the hashtag here, this is number of hands that, that the player has. The VPIP is VPIP. The PFR is their plea flop raise. Uh, AF is their aggression factor. Um, w is, um, there's the pipe symbol here. So the number before the pipe is the percentage of hands that go to showdown. After that symbol is the number of hands that they win that went to showdown the STL is steal and before the pipe that's a percentage that they steal this is percentage that they fold to steal the three bet symbol is here um, this is percentage they three bet percentage they fold to C bet and the CB is C bet and same thing percentage that they C bet versus percentage that they fold to C bet and then the N is how well they're doing for that session so for example this player here he's down almost almost to buy-in um, so just before we go any further for our viewers so you know exactly um, 
what these stats mean since I know a lot of people don't use Hold'em Indicator, they use PT4 or they use um, Hold'em Indicator. Just wanted to go over that real quick. So let me go ahead and do the, um, the rest of the preflop action. So the original Razor is interesting. He-Man raises preflop and he only have two hands on him. We really don't have any stats on him. Um, he four bets us a small amount and the person we were trying to squeeze to get him to call <clears throat> and get the original opener to fold, he folds. Um, at this point, my thoughts are is that with such a small four bet here, we're getting priced in, especially with ace queens near the top four range. I think we can profitably flat, even though we're out of position. Yeah, I think we have to call, but I'm already <clears throat> concerned that we could be in a reverse implied odds spot, and I'm kind of looking to make a nice draw or as I'd say for example if it came down ace too far yeah we'd probably have to just take a check call and all the way down but I'm far from in love with it right I mean yeah. he, we don't know he could have misclicked four bet here maybe the, the min four bet the clicky back four bet is something a lot of players will do there's been tons of videos around that just people like to click it back with really strong hands as far bet either just to induce really light calls or to induce spew. So I'm already a little bit concerned. But yeah, what can we do? I mean, we're not that we're going to go folding here, but we just have to be very concerned about paying off. Right, I agree. And so let me switch things up a bit. What if I had Ace Jack off? I think that's even more marginal. I think that might actually um, be a fold. It still is close. But I mean, it's just so close because it's hard to see exactly how much it is to us. But um, I think it's. It's one ten more, ninety more to us, is it? I think. Yeah, it's ninety more. So, you know, in terms of the pot odds, we're getting really good pot odds. I think he's giving us. Um, it actually tells me. So we're getting uh, three to one pot odds. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not I mean, Ace Jack off. It's in fairness, there's not a huge amount of difference between Ace Jack off and Ace Queen suited. And there is some difference, obviously. Out, we have a slightly better kicker. But if we assume he's doing this with. Aces, kings, queens, and ace, king. There isn't really a huge amount of difference yeah. between ace, queen, and ace, jack. It's not as much difference as you might think. Yeah. And well, the one thing that throws me off with a hand like ace, jack, suited, off suit is. So I think people um, underestimate the power of suitedness, especially um, in a big Yeah, of course. Well, suitedness gives us a chance to be aggressive in some spots where we can't be off suit. You know, we can start. Look, we can have some backdoor draws that we can we can use to be aggressive with. We can actually flop some genuine draws. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I would call, but I'm not happy about the situation. I'm already very wary about this. Could be a spot where they end up paying off <clears throat> three streets. I'm never really feeling comfortable about it. Right, I agree. And so I called, and I was thinking the same thing that you know I have to call here, but I'm not too happy about it. And um, I think this is probably almost one of the best situations for a flop for us. Granted, yeah, we didn't flop an ace, but we flopped the nut flush. And it's like you said, um, this allows you to be aggressive with a hand like this. Yeah, absolutely. It just depends how we're going to use this aggression now. And against somebody, again, it's a, it's a super small. So, well, it's, a, it's an irrelevant sample size. But if that C bet was, say, 100 over and he played say 70 or 80 hands I think we have a fantastic check race spot and we don't know anything about him um, I still think check race is by far the best line I think so too and I, I well, believe we, that's the line that I took but in we're the not fact... going to get him to fold aces and kings or anything like that obviously but we do give him a chance to like see bet fold ace king for example which is a fantastic result for us and, exactly. and just things like that yeah, and I think he's betting um, here with any pocket pair, probably tens or, or over, for the most part. And since he's an unknown, I wouldn't um, take pocket tens out of his four betting range either. No, I absolutely wouldn't. No, I mean that's not to say he's going to fall pocket tens too, but against pocket tens, pocket jacks, we are now a coin flip, so we don't mind getting all the money with the dead money in the pot. We'd rather not. We'd rather him see better than fall this king here. That would be an ideal result for us. Yeah, but we don't even mind that much getting in against pocket kings because we still have just about my rough maths we have 12 outs against pocket kings which is around like 48% I want to say something like that yep, might be a good time to that. pull you up too I mean it's it's almost a coin flip if we put if we do let's go ahead and, and do our collab so you, let's get them there's only really aces I think we're, in, still, we're still in bad shape against even against the aces now we'll do just all these We'll do Ace King. I think Ace King is definitely in his 
but he wouldn't probably wouldn't see but all combos of that. Though. He might not see but all right. combos of it. So He'll see but some combos, but not all. Let's take those out of a C bet combo, um, and then we'll put my hand in here, which is a queen suited of hearts. Mm. And then the board is wrong one. And we'll take a look at the equity. So yeah, it's I mean against that range. Um, tens plus. Yeah, against, against the top of his rage, we're pretty much flipping now. Uh, that's assuming that he does have tens and jacks, obviously, which I think he will have some of the time and all of it. But the basic point is, I think check jam is easily the best line here because we sometimes make him fold some of the stuff he's stabbing with. Right, exactly. And I think that gets back to the pre plot point of the importance of suitedness because we can play aggressive with the draw. Exactly. And yeah. We have the blocker to the to the nut flush, and we also have the queen. So um, it's hard for him to have a really strong heart draw as well that he's going to want to call us with. And if he does, and we hit, then we beat him anyways. So I check. Um, he C bets, and uh, let's go ahead and see the line I took. So I just took a jam, like you said. And yeah. I think I think that's his only. Uh, I mean, a three bet's going to pot commit him anyway, so we might as well jam here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, there, there are some people who say it turns our hand face up, etc. Not in terms of you, it does because we can, because it's made it so small, we can definitely have sets here. I mean, we have, I'm assuming that we're not always three betting sevens, fives, and fours, but we can have some sets because it's made it so small. People like to see bet suited connectors. We could easily have a hand like eight, seven suited here or something that's got a bunch of equity. So we don't always just have always enough rush draw here. But um yeah, we're we're not getting we're never gonna get to fold anything good. Let's be let's be honest about that. Yeah, it's mad designed to I mean possibly he could fold tens here, which is unlikely, but he, he might do it sometimes. We also give people a chance to misclick, which is always nice. And if he has misclick pre, which I think he possibly may have done with the with a small four, but again, we just get to collect more dead money to it this way than we do by donking out against some players. I would definitely consider just donking this flop. People who check back a lot, um, I would consider donking. But against someone we don't know anything about, check race has to be the best line. We have yeah. to assume someone's going to see bet in the four bet pot. Exactly, and that I think that's the point there. And, and the other reason why I like jamming all in with Ace Queen versus putting in three bet in, where we don't put him in, or potentially flatting his raise, is because even if he has aces or kings, um, if he doesn't have a heart and a heart comes off on the turn, or even something like a six, it's just going to kill all the action. And if he has kings or aces, and we're not going to get any more money out of him. So. No, I think if a heart come off, we'd potentially still get the money, but. Um, I'm seeing sixes, I'm seeing eights that that might come off and they might slow the action down and, and also but slow the action down in a way that it makes it hard for us to win because we're likely going to check again. He might check back and it just makes it harder for us to win the pot. And I think check jam is just really, really standard here. Yeah. And so that's the line we take and he calls and let's go ahead and take a look at what he had. Um, <clears throat> and you were right, he had a monster, so he had pocket kings. And we can go ahead and run it down. I think, I mean, if we call, the money's going in on the turn regardless. Yeah, um, with the absolutely. Set. But uh, it, it goes ahead and holds up for us. But I think that kind of goes to show against bad players, you can't you can't really look at um, some of their preflop actions. And, you know, he he men raised preflop with Pocket Kings. Um, it's just a shame now that <clears throat> we can put notes on players and provide them because that's a significant note to have the you know, min races then virtually I mean it doesn't quite mean four bets we virtually mean four bets I mean that's a strong note to have on somebody because if, then if they make a larger four bet next time you might imply they've got ace king or a bluff or who knows what but it means something so then when they deviate from this line it means we can start ruling some hands out a little bit more confidently yeah, exactly. And um, one thing that I wanted to say is, even though if you do, if you're watching us and you do play on Bavada, even though it's only session stats, I recommend taking notes. Um, after this hand played, I believe I took a note on him. When any, whenever anybody does anything super fishy like that, I take a note on him. Even though it's only for thirty hands, you still have. It's, yeah, it's still better that. than nothing. One Sorry. final point to make is, I think a lot of players would have five bet jammed in this spot or five bet and called it off or something um, 
I don't think that's necessarily a good line today. Again, somebody who you think is regularly messing around, um, it could be. Well, I see people do it all the time, and they do it just to make life easier for themselves. Like, well, got his queen suited. Um, if he's got kings or races or whatever to cool it, and they just they take some really lazy lines and they'll just ship it in thinking, well, so what? I must have some equity. Um, his queen suited is a strong hand, but against someone's five bet people's ranges for calling five bets in these games unless we have a reason to believe someone's a really weak and loose player we probably shouldn't be just giving up on our, giving up on the hand almost because that's what you do when you're jamming you're kind of like jamming almost resigned to when you get called that you're crushed right and, if and we... but I see people do it all the time and well not all the time but I see tons of players doing it and it's just so they can avoid tough decisions post flop and that's not what we're here to do it's post flop and it's our post up skill advantage is what's going to make us most of our money and if we are just constantly like shipping it in with ace queen suited pre when someone's put them in four bets in we're not really going to be doing ourselves too many favours no and if you think about at the micro stakes especially on Bovada is that when people start four betting five betting you know they usually have the nuts and so yeah well unless they're suited, managed, you know ace queen suited doesn't play well against uh, oh it does really range. badly it, yeah. it, it, we just pulled away it does really badly when people look at it you see it as a premium hand and it is it's a really strong hand I'm not saying it's not a strong hand I'm not saying people shouldn't play aggressively but specifically when we get four bet it's not it's nowhere near as strong as we like to think it's too easy to overestimate our equity and just ship it in the middle thinking people are far better bluffing and people are doing this and that they're probably not most of the time uh, and just don't do it just if you don't only do it if you genuinely think there's a good chance that you can be caught by worse otherwise you're just turning a really playable hand into a bluff right exactly and i think that's where it comes down to post flop and if we got a bad flop on here this is easy just check fold yeah we just give up if that comes down five four seven rainbow or five four seven with no hearts and we've got a really easy check for we had a profitable call pre-flop and then we just got a really easy check for the hand didn't work out for us we move on exactly and we risk another nine big blinds versus jamming all in yeah as we said we we, we we put the caveat right at the start we're really aware that we're in a bad reverse implied spot here for example in this spot had the flop come down queen 10-6 we probably would have ended up calling check calling at least two bets and then on the river we would have probably convinced ourselves to call as well yeah, and that's exactly. what I meant by we have a really bad reverse implied spot but we're playing to basically to flop strong draws or two pair or better that's kind of why we're playing it and we're getting pricing to do that because of this small format yeah exactly alright well I think we did some pretty good analysis in this hand I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause the video for our viewers since I do have our, our not so great hold'em indicator um, hand replayer where I have to go and browse hands but we'll be back in one sec It'll be seamless for you guys, but on our end, we're going to do a little bit of finding on the next video, and we'll be back in a second. All right, so back again with our second hand. Um, I'll go ahead, Reg, for you and go through some of the preflop action. I have Jack-9 off in the big blind, and it gets folded around to cut off that mix of min rays. Um, dealer folds, small blind folds, and getting 3.5 to 1. Um, this guy I have 32 hands on, and he looks like a fish. He's a 38-9. I think I can defend big blind fairly wide against a bad player. Getting getting such good odds and on um, My initial thoughts, as soon as I saw the setup, before I saw someone min raise, my initial thoughts were fault, just because it's a rubbish hand without a position. But he, given this, what you said, he's min raised and he's a bad player. I would definitely call but in general had he 3x'd it or had he been a slightly better player I wouldn't defend yeah, Just I... Say he was say 19, 15 and he been raised I think we have significantly less reasons to play the hand against him just because he's like to be a better player he's not going to make too many mistakes and our hand is pretty terrible so that's, that's a bit right it's Jack Nine also it's not a nice hand it's not a good hand there's not that many good things can happen for us with it um, so yeah I would call against this player but I wouldn't call against all players exactly and that's I think I didn't mention that but I think if, if he did a 3x or 3.5x I think it's just an insta fold but given that he just been raised and we're getting three and a half to one, and he's such a bad player, I can call. But if it was this player, a twenty-two twenty-two, I think it's an insta fold. 
Yeah, before we tackle the post flop bit, um, I think this does bring up a, a leak a lot of people I work with have, and that is they do defend too late. You know, it's just your blinds. We're going to lose the blinds all the time. People defend too light, and then it's not so much the initial call that gets them in trouble. The initial call, if you've got some nice post flop skills, is probably fine. But most of the players that be watching this video and most of the players that come to us for help probably don't have enough post flop skills to make these loose pre flop calls yet. Yeah. I so, agree. yeah, just, just play really tight from the blinds. Don't get all possessive over them. Everyone puts them in. You know, if you want to defend, the way I look at defending blinds is um, I won't really defend my blind too much. I'll just make sure I do my fair share of stealing. So, therefore, I'm theoretically getting him, getting it back that way. Rather than defending by playing bad hands out of position, I'll make sure that I'm stealing at least as much or more than the general population. So, therefore, I'm getting them back in a different way. Yeah, exactly. And I think so for the beginning players. Definitely don't be trying to defend too wide. I think if you go on forums, people will say, oh, you definitely need to be defending an X percentage of your, your blind range because their stealing range is so wide. But if you don't have good post hop skills, then a small pre-flop mistake is going to be huge in terms of the money you lose post-flop. But with this jack-9 off against a 38-9, um, I think that I, I can defend fairly easily. And if I flop a good flop, then, um, you know, in terms of So what of would you consider skill, to be a good flop? A good flop. I think anything that allows me to to uh, check call with a straight draw, um, so like an N A ten X or maybe um, a ten queen X type of a flop, or you know, of course, two pair uh, would be great as well. But in terms of if I did flop, if it was a Jack X X type of a hand, I'd be playing that very cautiously. Just because he's only raising again, he's raising. Yeah, I know it's it's a small sample size, but he's probably raising around 10% of his range. Yeah. So if a jack hits, he's probably got a jack 10 or better. So what side of flops do you see yourself being aggressive on? Because I'm not bothered about balance. I've said it a million times, of course. I'm not too bothered about balance, but having said that, we do need to have some kind of aggression as well in this spot. We can't just always be on a check call, check for like. Exactly. So what sort of flops against this particular player would you be looking at try to check race? So would you be waiting for trips or something or would you be doing it more with like the weakest draws that you hit just say it came down like ten two four? Would you then choose to turn you know that your backdoor draw into a bluff against a player who we think isn't good? Would you be waiting for trips for two pairs? What sort of thing would it be? No, I'd be doing two pairs, or I'd be doing um, like a gutter draw to the straight. Yeah, or I mean, yeah. of course, an open ender. But I mean, I think a gutter draw I could play with a check raise type of line. I think um, we could even take a line with a jack where where we three bet fold as well. Yeah, I think I agree with you there. I would have definitely gone with the with the, with some of the worst draws that I don't mind folding and then obviously my stronger made hands that's kind of where I was at with it I was I was glad you didn't say I would raise if it came down like queen 10 or something because I don't think we have a ton of fold equity against something like queen x because it, this guy's going to have high cards quite a lot and I'd rather check raise the 10 8 than the queen than like the queen x type Type right. things where we can flop a, a good shot with the queen ten, or we can flop a good shot. Uh, sorry, we can flop an open and do with the queen ten, the ten eight. I think the ten eight's a far better one to check race than the queen ten, just because this guy's going to have all, quite a few queen x in his range with him raising quite small. So that's kind of what I wanted to get at there. Yeah, I agree. And and also, if we flop an open ender, if we take a check call line, if we make the straight on the turn, if he has a queen, or you know, if he has two pair, if he turns two pair, then we're going to get a lot more value on later streets against well, the yeah, pair. I would check raise a ten eight sometimes because we're drawing to the nuts, and we also I mean, it won't be much use a lot of the time, but we also have one over card. Whereas with the queen ten, we're not drawing to the nuts, and we don't have our pair outs are way less clean too which is why I asked the question specifically because there are some uh, open enders I would check raise and there was some true. yeah that is true with the queen 10 we're drawing to the second nut and so we can get ourselves again in a, to a reverse implied off situation yeah, we think down, we have the nuts down, and we have second the, nuts yeah. we end up getting stacked when he's got the ace jack and we we're there with the nine jack right yeah exactly and so I make the call and I flop bottom two on a really wet board that hits a lot of his range. Um, 
I believe I check. Right. I, I check. I guess somebody like him is a 38.9. I'd be a little bit motivated to dunk into him here, targeting a lot of his pair plus cut shot type hands or his, his like if he's got, like say for example, he has ace jack. He might check that back. Um, I don't particularly want him checking any cut shots back or anything like that. Just because he's, he looks like he's a passive player, we can't bank on him C bait. Right. Uh, we've got, definitely got a value hand. I mean, unless he's, he's you know, he's obviously he can have some better hands. Well, as far as flops go for us, I like this as I'm just going to bet into the guy. I mean, obviously, I'm going to slow down should an eight, a king, a ten. And ace or something. There's tons of bad cards for us. And I just think it's a disaster if we check and we let him check back and any card over an eight comes. Our hands decrease significantly in value. And I think there's value to be had. Well, primarily it's because I don't trust him to see bet. Right. And um, I felt he was going to see bet because the see bet's 100% over 32 hands. So I took a check line instead. Yep. And he see betted. <clears throat> And I think this is a, a good spot for a three bet, but I also think it's okay to check behind as well, just because this hits a lot of his range. Um, I, I think, I think I we get value out. from is worse. That, uh, I think ahead. we can definitely get value from worse. We can absolutely get value from worse, but it's just it's going to be really hard for us to get a lot of money in this pot and have the best hand because he, he's a sort of player who is likely going to call a check raise and like I say half the deck's terrible for us exactly so um, I believe I I chickened out on the three bet because it was so wet um, and it hit so much of his pre-flop raising range and his c-betting range here um, I think I opted for pot control and yeah but so... I, to be honest I would have checked called rather than check raise which is why I prefer donking because we just start like checking and hoping he bets and we're kind of hoping to check call check call and then maybe even just go check check on the river because if we play like this three barrels on a board like this our bottom two isn't going to be as good as perhaps we hope it will be yeah, because I this think... sort of player will probably check back king queen at some point and I think this is probably some looks similar to probably what his range would be when he flop. is c-betting on the flop. Probably something like this. Um, I guess I can roll aces and kings in there as well, and probably ace-jack and ace-queen as well. But I think against his range, I think we're probably about to flip. I think he's going to be betting queens, any 10x, any over pair, maybe even uh, ace-jack, king-jack as well. I wouldn't has equity. think he's betting too often with the... King Jack and Ace Jack type stuff. Personally, I wouldn't put all combos of them in. I would put some in, Let's but not that. all, because I think this style player is going to check back second pair on this kind of board a lot, just because they fear the check raise and they kind of want to. I just just make sure that, like you said, they, they you wanted to pot control. They, people like to pot control too. Yeah, and let's. I'll go ahead and let's take a look. I have. Um, let me get my suit out there. I'll take a look and see what my equity looks against that type of a range on such a board. And it's about a coin flip. Yeah, but that's a coin flip if we all got in now. It's, exactly. He's going to find it way easier to realize his equity than we are to realize ours because that's what position gives us. Exactly. He he's in position. Way more options. Yeah. He, he gets to decide when the bet's going or he gets to decide when when money goes in from his point of view as we kind of don't have as much control over that as he does. Right, I agree. And, I mean, well, he's got position and, mm. like you said, half the, deck, half the cards in the deck are going to be bad for us. Any yeah. eight, any ten, any Broadway. I mean, I mean, for example, if it came an offsuit two now, it came the two of clubs. We're going to check. He's going to check back a lot. You know, he really is, and that's a dreadful catch. I mean, that's just that's killed all our action. If we have got the best hand, um, and I'll let you say what your thoughts were first. So I agree. I mean, and and I I looked at this in terms of his range. Just I I mean, this just. If he see bet with, with an open ended uh, draw with maybe he had jack ten, nine ten, queen ten, king ten, I mean, 
the A just put the straight there, or if he already maybe he had the king ten, he already had the straight. Um, but even if he didn't, any any ten x type of conjure draw just got there, and and if it didn't, it's going to kill the action regardless because he's going to be afraid that we have the ten. Um, and so in terms of this, I think with the jack nine off, of course, it's obviously a check because we're never going to get called by worse here. Um, yes, potentially we could get called by like a, a queen, a queen nine or a queen eight him looking to redraw but a lot of his value ranges where he's if we lead out he's going to be calling and then if he leads out then we're obviously behind yeah I mean I wouldn't we, we, we could bet here because him checking back king queen is definitely a possibility now um, I would just check and fold unless he made it really I mean the pot's 145 if you bet like 50 cents I wouldn't fold then but I'm kind of just you know, let's try and get a really cheap short down and if I can't get that I'm just yeah I'm just and he bet super point. small he gave me four to one odds so. but going back to pre-flop this is why I don't like really just defending these sort of hands because we've got one of the best flops we could have for our hand and on the turn we're in all sorts of bother we're <laughs> just like now what yeah, exactly. And I think that's what comes down to, I think, a new player. They may just get um, glued to their two pair and go broke with his hand. Now, when he bets 40, I'm calling just because, A, I believe I can still have the best hand, and, B, mm -hmm. we could hit a jack or a nine or something and exactly. suck out. I mean, we, have, we have roughly, you know, six outs, um, you know, to hit it. So we only need to make up about, you know, 10% equity and applied odds. So we're getting a really good price to call. And I believe, yes, I do call. So getting a good price, we call. And then, um, again, even a worse card, even if he just had yeah, uh, a queen X. That's, I mean, that's probably just about the no worst now. Right. The flush it got there. The straight was already there. If he had a queen X, he just, we just got counterfeited. So at this point, it's just a check fold. And so I do check, and he checks back. And let me see. If I, I think... This could be an interesting spot to to do something funky. To fire out a bluff. I need to know more about bluff. this guy. But yeah, because I mean, literally everything from the flop's got there now. And if he does does just have like Queen X or even ten, I mean, he's probably never going to fold ten X. So yeah. I'm not trying to get him to fold a straight, but. We can possibly get him off Queen Jack, uh, Ace Queen, King fold, Queen, Ace Queen, yeah. Um, yeah, anything that's basically not a straight or better, but still beats us. It's kind of a little bit tempting because I, I, I don't think, think we really have that much showdown value. I think this against a good thinking player, I think this would be a great spot to bluff. But I think against a loose passive player that bet two streets, I don't think he's ever folding a. Yeah, I mean, if I think he's, if, if I think he's never going to fold, ten x at least a small percent of the time which isn't really what I'm getting into for but it's nice if he can just say he might do but I'm primarily just trying to get him off um, all this one pair stuff that now beats and obviously crushes us so I think I'd be somewhat tempted to have a go at it to be honest with you because, just because I know I, I probably don't win if it goes check check no I agree our showdown value is terrible here and if we bet like three quarters of the pot we don't have to win that often I mean we have to win less than, than half of the time to break even so if we're assuming he has 10x half the time and the rest of the time he has something like two pair with with the queens um, or he has like pocket kings um, if we can get him to fold that then I, you know, I think we'd probably be able to do that half the time yeah I mean it's just relying on people to fall isn't that's the issue I think it's a good spot theoretically to do it but in practice people people that aren't that good at folding kings aces and queen x in this spot but having said that I think it's something definitely to think about I wouldn't just instantly check right I would at least consider betting yeah exactly and I think it's really player dependent I think that's yeah a lot of that comes spot. down to game flow if you've seen him frequently fold rivers or you've seen him Call down in with some really weak hands. Obviously, that would influence your decision. We haven't got that information now. Where had I seen him fall a ton of rivers, I would definitely do it. Had I seen him regularly call down with second pair, third pair, and stuff, then I wouldn't even dream of doing it. Yeah, I agree. I think it, like you said, it comes down to plane flow, it comes down to your reads on the player and how they're playing at the time. But it's kind of hard to do that analysis, especially with the basic HUD. 
So yeah, um, yeah, I fold and we'll take a look and see what he had. So he had the straight um, on the on the turn, but I don't think, um, like you said, it's so much easier for him to realize his equity than us. I think even if we three bet him or if we donked out on the flop, we we're just building up a bigger pot. Um, but in terms uh, of this hand, you know, these last two cards on the river and the turn were the worst for us. But um, you know, if we had two blanks, we would have definitely post flop. We would have got some money out of him. And that's a, this is the problem. Make had it come down a bad turn card for him, and yet an off suit two or something, or an ace or something like that. He's just going to check back and punch with that hand because right. it's. I mean, it's kind of. I think that's why you bet kind of smallish because he kind of knew he had the nuts. But had he not bet the turn. I mean, I think a lot of the time he's going to check back the turn for, for fear of getting raised off his hands. You see these players do it all the time. You see them posting forums, I didn't want to bet because oh, I didn't want to get raised. And then it's just something you see a lot of, which is why against these players, we can make the exploitable play and we can just donk our two pairs or bet against them and just hope we've got a piece, which is probably what I would have done. I'd have probably donked the flop and then when that turn came and obviously that ruins my plans but if it come down here too I would have just gone donk donk and if it really came and break I would have donked again yep yeah that makes complete sense to me um, taking the donk on against, the against a up. passive player against an aggressive player I wouldn't do it but against a passive player who I think is going to check at some point or maybe not even guaranteed to see bet because he is I know he's see bet saying 100% but it's a small sample size exactly. I'm more inclined to look at his 38-9 and believe passive Right. So against them players, I'm just going to play an exploitable line. I'm just going to go donk, 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 unless the board changes significantly. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, uh, I think that would have been a good line to take, um, disregarding the last two cards. Yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, once that comes down, the donk, donk, donk goes right out the window, and it's just exactly. checked all the time. Okay, well, I think that, that was some pretty good advice, and I think it was a bit of an interesting hand defending out of position. Um, let's go ahead and load up one more. We'll go ahead and pause the video for one second. All right, so we're back with our third hand, and we're going to wrap up the video with the third hand since we're we're running over our 30-minute timeline. We're um, trying to cut it off around 45 minutes. So I have a king jack off in the cutoff, and it looks like it gets folded around to me. It's standard open. Um, with King Jack off, I get called by uh, a bit of a laggish type of player in um, the dealer position. Small blind folds and um, big blind comes along. Uh, this is that same player that had the Queen 10 off earlier, uh, the previous hand we just showed, and this is about eight hands later. So um, we know that he's lumping a wide range and he's raising more of his, you know, Broadway range. And then this player he just looks very, very loose over 15 hands and go ahead and pull up the flop and so before I I do my um, my pre-flop action I'll, I'll give an idea um, I assume he's probably going to check to me when he checks I think this is standard C bet it's so dry we don't have to bet large um, to push them out of the pot I think that um, you know anything around 60 to 3 60 percent to 3 quarters pot is pretty standard here um, I'm interested to see on your point of being nice to push them out of the pot that implies that uh, we're trying to make people fall draws when the board's a bit wetter which I don't think ever happens and I'm not sure if you just it didn't come out as you as you if your words didn't come out the way you wanted them to well if it was saying jack two eight but the two was a club or the two was a spade um if you were thinking that by betting large you get them to fold draws, I think that would be a mistake and on your part if you had thought that. Oh no, and no, it, and the thing is, is that when we like said, I think you probably just wet, is we we don't want them to fold. We just want to charge them more. Yeah, we get we're we're still more value. value. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah, not betting for it. protection. I think that's a misnomer in poker. People say I'm betting for protection. No, you're betting for value. You want yeah, to get exactly, more value. Yeah. From, and that's, from and that's the point I wanted to get to. And I thought that when you said it. You're not the sort of person who would come out with it and mean it that way, which is why I just wanted to clarify it for anyone watching, thinking that, you know, what we think by betting big, we get people to fold draws. That's not the case. And I knew you didn't think that way. I just thought it was a point worth clarifying. Oh, um, I appreciate that. But I do disagree with you a little bit, though, because I would just bomb away here uh, because I just think I'm going to get called a lot, and I think I've got the best handle on it. I think, for example, if someone's got two nines, 
If they're going to call 60, they're probably going to call 80. If someone's got Jack 10, you know, all the hands that are going to call a 60 are uh, almost always going to call 80, so why not just pay 80? Yeah, that's yeah, my way of that looking. Sense. That's my way of looking at it. I just it's very exploitable because if I had a worse jack here, like jack nine, I probably wouldn't bet as big because there's less worse hands that can call. And if I had pocket tens, I wouldn't bet as big because I'd be targeting any any pair that was worse than a jack. But yes, it's it's exploitable. But as we've discussed before, I don't believe in being particularly well balanced in these games. Just make the exploitable play until we feel someone's exploiting us so I would definitely go bigger I would go at least 80 okay yeah and that makes sense as well um, and if we look at I'll just take a quick look at the HUD stats I mean um, this guy's a holding folding to 100% c-bet so uh, you know we're out in the play I can't really look at his stats this guy's never folding so we definitely if I bet bigger I expect at least one of them to call and it's like you said we're going to get called by by a pair of eights at the board pocket nines pocket tens um, nine ten mm. and probably like a queen ten a, there's a just tons, tons there's of so many. shots draws there's exactly. absolutely loads of stuff that can call us so let's just well we see it in so let's take a look and see what happens so uh, player one checks and so I bet 65 so yeah you know I could have put out another you know one and a half yeah that's lines, not, that's not too that small there. it's far from no. too small it's just, I, what... it's just my personal style thing I mean that's a it's a very standard C bet sizes absolutely no problem with it had you made it like 50 or something I would have had a major issue oh no but, uh, 65 yeah it's a yeah, bottom that's... of what I would bet but it's fine there's nothing wrong with 65 yeah 65 is roughly um, just under three quarters pot so yeah and, and I think we could have bet a little more but I think that's okay and so let's go see uh, I'm assuming this player is going to call because he hasn't folded any C-bet so far. Um, as expected, he calls, and then this player that's folded to 100%, um, it looks like he just decided not to play. I, I'm assuming this player probably would have donked out if he had something, potentially. But when he calls, I, I still think that he has a super wide range, like we said. Any um, gut shot draws, any pocket pairs, maybe even pocket sevens or sixes are probably going to call if he's really loose. And then on the turn, we get an ace of hearts. And I, I really, uh, when I played this hand and, and I did an analysis on this hand, um, I really think the ace of hearts really doesn't change much of anything at all. I think this is a good example. Of, we've talked about this before, where a scare card isn't a scare card for me. Yeah, I'm just thinking brick there, of course. Exactly. He can have ace eight suited sometimes. So he can have ace jack. I mean, I would imagine a player who we think might be aggressive would three bit ace jack at least some of the time. Um, yeah, so if he's got the ace, he's either got just some stone cold floats or ace eight, perhaps ace two. You know, the ace, it's somewhat, it's not ideal because it makes it harder for us to get called by a worse hand. But having said that, I don't think it's a terrible hand in terms of it's going to be beating us too often. It's just going to make it harder for us to get value and. Um, it's just going to it's going to slow everything down and that's the issue I've got with it if we were in position I'd be way less bothered because he could check us we could just carry on betting but with us being out of position it kind of gives him a slight a slight a slight advantage I think because we can't really make a large bet here um, if we make a smaller bet it gives us the option to make a raise and a sack our bet size which is something we've talked about in the past and now if people start making small bet sizes on the turn I like to get after them because generally it means people are just they're not wanting to check call but they're not wanting to give the initiative up so yeah it puts us in a difficult spot in terms of are we going to bet and if we are what's our sizing going to be yeah, or, is this, or is this a sort of player who we, if we think they're aggressive can we start check calling against them if we think they're going to start turning 10-9 into a bluff or I mean, I, don't, I mean, I think, for example, they think he'd check back 8x and jack x. Where any of his, his floats with draws, they're going to be quite tempted to bet when we check. So it's a matter of do we think this guy is aggressive enough where we can profit of the check call? Is he the sort of calling station that we can still get value from 10 jack and queen jack? And there's a sort of questions we have to ask ourselves before we decide what to do. Right. And uh, that's the hard part of uh, doing the end history view and being of course it is. It's, hard. it's hard in general. And it's like there's so many unknowns. But it's like you said, if we were at the table in the game flow and we've seen previous hands where he was taking stabs when the preflop aggressor, you know, see about the flop and check the turn, 
where he decides to get aggressive and go for what he looks like is dead money, then I think a spot like this, this is an easy check call line. Yeah, it's definitely um, a game flow situation. And um, I don't expect you to be able to remember it from I don't know when the sound was played, but you're not going to remember all like, the intrinsic details of what's happened. Exactly. But this is why. But in, this is just for discussion for you to think about when you're playing. Is how do you think this guy is? Is he sticky? If he's a bit stationary, and then we carry on barreling to get value from Jack X. If we think he's the Zara player who's going to attack weakness then especially on this card which gives you quite a lot of incentive to bluff then we can consider check calling but we have to really think about check calling two streets in and just hoping he hasn't somehow too bad up. right exactly and and if we look at his stats i mean they can be misleading after 15 hands but he hasn't he hasn't folded any c bets and he's faced three bets he hasn't folded any three bets so we can assume that that he likes to to see flops and turns so um we can also assume that he could potentially he's a type of player he's c bet 22 percent but he may have just c bet once here so we can't even rely on that no that was three that's three bet 22 percent right no i'm i uh, know i'm saying that he exactly i think it shows that he's three bet 22 percent but he's only played 15 hands so that might have just been he three bet one single hand um since he's yeah, I would have got all these moment. stats for the purpose of this hand. The discussion we just had there is more for if we have more reads on people. We just the bottom man is in this exact spot. We we don't know. We're, we're effectively playing blind now. Exactly. And, and um, I don't, I don't see it's it's a tough spot because we have no real reads on what sort of player this guy is. We don't right. know. He could, he could be 40, 33 because he just had good hands. He could be 40, 33 because he's terrible. But he still has enough bad hands, sorry, mediocre hands to, to play. We just don't know. Um, if we had a bigger sample, this is why I'm talking about um, game flow situations. If we'd been playing this guy for an hour, we'd have a way better idea of what to do than we do right now. And the bottom line is right now, we don't know what to do. We don't know enough about him. Yep, exactly. So he comes down I those... Yeah, and I, I, Sorry, I think that's I one of the two lines that you said. Yeah, I took one of the lines you said, either, you know, we bet a smaller amount that's exploitive to get him to call because the ace is a scared card for him, or we take a check call yeah. line. And so so I take the smaller bet line, which I think... No, that would have been my standard here, just because, again, I'm not that worried about being exploited. I would have bet possibly... That would have been, the, you know, somewhere between, like, a dollar to what you'd have, maybe a dollar thirty. Yeah. So we're in that range. Some of this is definitely going to encourage him to call. We are, and now we're value betting. Once we choose to bet, that means we're value betting and hoping he's going to call with the weaker parts of his range still. So if we want him to do that, we kind of have to make it enticing for him to call. Exactly. And if he had a hand like a queen 10, then he just picked up a double gutter. So yeah, we're obviously trying to get him to call with a small bet like this. And we'll go ahead and see what happens. And, and he folds. Um, but I, I kind of wanted to, to bring up this hand just yeah. to show because I think a lot of beginning players will see the ace on the turn and they'll just immediately stop and slow down and be scared to continue with the hand. Yeah, and then, and then it, that's when it comes into what do we know about this player? In this situation, we didn't know a lot, so I much prefer the small bet than the check because uh, I think he's going to react more honestly to a small bet than he is if we check. So therefore, you know, I think we can get some value you and it make, if he raises it makes it quite an easy fall whereas if we checked and he bet we kind of like well are we induced to bet or oh, whatever we just don't know so yeah it's kind of you could almost say no we don't bet just for information we're betting for thin value but we gain more reliable information when he raises than we do if we check I agree because, because then if... we don't know what's motivated him and then we could well I could well get flamed for for saying that but we, sometimes we bet and we do collect information at the same time I wouldn't not betting just for the information we're betting for thin value but we can also pick up some information too assuming that our small bet's not going to get exploited yeah no that's true um and if we take the check call line and we bet 122 what if he comes out and he bets you know close to 80 percent pot we don't know yeah. if we are calling you know we're, we're calling more than what we would have originally bet but we don't know if we're ahead or behind at that point yeah and that's the beauty of blocker bets because people tend not to exploit them anywhere near as much as they should which is one of my favorite things to do i try and exploit blocker bets because i know most people are once they put a blocker bet sizing in they usually are for them right so i will personally exploit that but i don't believe enough people exploit me for it to discourage me from doing it and i don't think people exploit 
the player pool enough on Bovada and microstakes for us to even worry about it at all. So uh, that's oh, really absolutely. something you really don't even really have to consider. And I think that's why we <clears throat> have to play exploitively like this, where we can get exploited. But these players here are so bad that they don't even know to do that. So your line would be my default in this situation for sure. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think that's pretty default. standard for me and you. But I just wanted to, you know. Bring this hand to highlight for some of the beginner players that you know. I think this turn could be a really scary spot for them, but I think for somebody like me and you, it's pretty standard. And just you know, just showing what you can do there and what you should do. And like you said, um, some of the in-game decisions you can make based upon you know what you're seeing at the table as well. So um, I think we'll end it with that. We are at 50 minutes. Um, What's funny is Reg and I thought we were going to do five minutes per hand, but we ended up taking around 10 to 15 minutes per hand. But I think it was good in-depth analysis. Um, Reg, thanks so much for doing this. And for our viewers, let us know what you think. Did you like our in-depth hand history analysis? If you'd like to see more, let us know. We can definitely do more of these in addition to live play. Um, and thanks for watching, Reg. Thanks again. Appreciate it so much. You're welcome, buddy. It's always fun. All right, and uh, I believe for our next video, either I'll be doing some live play or Reg will be doing some live play. Uh, this has been Alton for MicroGrinder.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.